Uh, give us your thoughts of when you first saw the property in 87 or 88. Well, <laughs> when you first walked out here, and of course you walked down the ocean along the, on the beach, and uh, it's, it's a, it was just, nothing was here. And so, you know, it's a great beach, and you really loved it. And, and the atmosphere and the ambience of the beach was just something else. And, and they pointed out the area, <clears throat> and we walked down the beach. And they, uh, they, you couldn't even walk on the ground inside because it was covered with just bushes, very low, but they were thick, and you couldn't even walk in and see what the ground was like inside. But uh, the ambience of the ocean and the beach and, this, and the idea of building a golf course where there are not going to be any houses inside the golf course and what they were trying to do, I knew that. And, uh, and then when they announced they were going to have the Ryder Cup here in, in less than two years, so here's a golf course that's not even being built, and they are also already announcing they're going to have the Ryder Cup. Well, I was on cloud nine. I was like, you, you, you couldn't have been any better than that. I, I, I didn't realize I was going to have a small hurricane come by next month. And, but uh, at that time, we had two years to get ready for the tournament. Now, did you, they get you to build the course and then they had the Ryder Cup here? Or, or did they decide the Ryder Cup was going to be here and brought you in? No, they, they, uh, they, uh, they, when they, they announced they're going to have the Ryder Cup here. We hadn't even, I haven't even made a drawing or a map of where the uh, holes were going to go or anything. And they just said, in this area, we're going to have the Ryder Cup. Of course, the uh, landmark that owned the, uh, the golf courses here at that time had Turtle Point, and, and if we didn't have this finished, why, they could they had a backup. But they intended to have it out here. Okay. Uh, what made the challenges to the site present? Well, you know, uh, at that time, the you uh, you have all the environmental concerns that they have on a, on a point like this. And we try to recycle all the water and everything else in, in doing this, and doing this golf course. But what happened, uh, everything we tried to really plan for and do in the, uh, started in, in um, August, I guess it was 89. It was two years before the Ryder Cup. It must have been August of 89. The Ryder Cup was in 91, so it was August of 89. And then, then uh, we had it all planned and had the equipment out here. See, I actually built the golf course, designed it and built it on site. And, and we rented the equipment and, and had young boys from ag school. Jason McCoy was one of the head ones down here. He's from Lake City College. And he, was a, he works for Greg Norman now. But Jason was here and we had it all worked out where we were gonna put the holes and et cetera. And then and we just started clearing to see what was underneath and then here came Hugo, and Hugo just uh, annihilated all the bushes and all the trees and everything. So uh, it was after the hurricane, uh, uh, first you, you couldn't even get out to the island, and the road was closed, and we barged a lot of the uh, material in on, uh, from Beaufort, South Carolina, to get to keep things going. But uh, uh, the, the the dunes were all washed away uh, on, along the edge of the ocean, were gone, and uh, and everything was just annihilated, the whole thing. And and then Governor Campbell declared a moratorium that we could go back on this, on the edge of the ocean and take sand and rebuild the dunes. So it was a whole different process after the hurricane. And the uh, we were able to restore Willits and Ivis Pond. They were all, it was, everything was just blown down in there. And we created the saltwater marshes there, and so it was an entirely different process of, after the uh, after the hurricane. Now, how different was the course that you originally planned to what showed up at the very end here? Originally planned? Well, actually, um, it was all it was more in this end of the island, and then I found out that uh, in between the, the two nines. Uh, uh, there was a big area that they said was uh, outside of the uh, critical line. And it didn't make much sense because it was the driest part of the ground. And why would all of a sudden it, it be marked outside? But it was marked. And uh, they had it on their maps that they, it was this where the practice area is now uh, was outside the critical line. Well, it actually happened, what happened when they were surveying the critical line, which is right along the edge of the ocean like coming down 14 and 15, 16, 17, 
the, um, the um, critical line was uh, marked, but then the man went to lunch and dropped a stake over by where the old clubhouse is now, and they moved it in and un unintentionally. Uh, unintentional mistake. And uh, of course, so, so when uh, we started building the golf course and we were scheduled to try to get it done for the Ryder Cup, well, we couldn't wait for the change and have the government come back and, 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 and there was a mistake. And in fact, uh, it was when we were about two thirds done or three quarters done, uh, they came out and said, oh, we made a mistake, this land you can use. So of course they used it for the driving range and the parking for the, uh, for the Ryder Cup. But that's why the two golf courses are separated. And I probably, maybe it's better because down there you, you uh, move the, lane, the golf course down on Ivis and Willits and all, which is part of it today. Well, uh, along that line, I mean, you have the topography here is through the margins of the trees and the back nine is, is through the dunes. Now, yeah. how, I mean, how difficult was it to bring continuity those two diverse pieces of Well, you know, the, the, the back here, it's all sand, and then you say the marshes, and it had, had the uh, live oak trees that were around right now. It was a different piece of property. And from um, where the practice area, that, that was all just flat. And um, we created all the dunes there, there, but there wasn't any wetlands in that area. So we created more of the sand dune look on that nine holes. Uh, when everybody says, well, somebody will tell me that it's, it's different. Yeah, the topography was different. I don't ever think of about it. it is, uh, we made a difference in, we didn't try to uh, make a different look or anything like that. It just, the uh, the back nine just was open and it was more sand and we created the dunes after the uh, after the hurricane. Mm -hmm. So the wind just blew them right off the, yeah, the yeah. southern storm here. Yeah. Uh, did you have any doubts that you'd finish in time for the Ryder Cup? <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought we were doing it pretty good, uh, and um, and in this part of the world, when you plant uh, Bermuda grass early in in uh, April or May, you know it's going to come on in in uh, two or three months. And the Ryder Cup being in September, I was sure. But if anybody came out here and looked at the golf course the first of April, they think, "Well, we're crazy." But that's uh, that's uh, it's true of any golf course that when you get it planted in in early April. In South Carolina or Florida, it's it's going to grow in pretty well by the first of September, and uh, it just came in at the last minute. But that's what it's done on, on about everybody's course. Now, you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you have a lot of trouble with the dunes shifting overnight when you were building this? You like well, water down the dunes? no, no question about it. When we, when you build anything in sandy, like the especially the uh, the backside, and get the dunes up. And the, and the wind would blow and then it changed the, so you're always fighting that to try to keep the same contour that you try to establish. And, and therefore you're irrigating it constantly to try to keep the sand from moving until you get it planted. And, and it was in, uh, in this golf course, even today, uh, it, it swims and walks, it moves, you know. And it's just all the way sand dunes are, they, they're gonna constantly blow and move and change. Is that one of the reasons you come back three times? Or? Well, you always come back, and it, it, I, I've uh, I've rebuilt the Tournament Players Club in Jacksonville now four times. I've Harbor Town three times, and and uh, Long Cove a couple of times, and Crooked Stick two or three times. I'm just out living all my <laughs> my old golf courses, and golf courses grow and change, and uh, over a period of time, and and the vegetation even gets thicker or thinner and things like that. And, and I've always uh, uh, really enjoyed coming back to the golf courses I've worked on in the past. Um, right now, the Honors Golf Course in Chattanooga is, is, is a good golf course, and, and I'm working on it, on, working on the 10th hole right now, trying to, um, I guess, clear up my past mistakes, or whatever you want to call it. But golf courses change, and, and, and the main thing that's changed is the agronomics, the, the agronomy, how they grow grasses, it changed dramatically. And then, you know, everybody knows that the, the golf ball and the clubs have changed, mm -hmm. the game of golf. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the uh, internal drainage system that you have here that uh, recycles the water. And... Well, we got a, when we were out here building the golf course and, 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 and we were creating the sand dunes, and of course you had to, to do that, 
had to get sand from someplace, so we created the ponds out by 15 and 16. And we found out that that uh, by doing that, when we dug down there, that the, there was a, a lens of fresh water that was floating on top of the salt water. So we, we decided to try to set the whole thing up and recycle all the water so it doesn't go into the marshes. None of the runoff goes into the marshes. We recycled all back into our irrigation pond, which pumps it back onto the golf course. And it's amazing, the, uh, the ponds over there on, on 15, 16, and 17, they have a lens of uh, fresh water that continuously goes in there. And we monitor that and just siphon a little bit of that off all the time. We, the wells out here on the island are real deep in there. They have a lot of salinity in it and bicarbonates, and different things. But the past palm grass thrives on that, where Bermuda grass is a little shaky. But uh, uh, so we're using a combination of, the, of recycled water and a combination of, of the well water that's it's brackish out here. Um, it says that uh, I understand that you had the first hole in one of the course on number 14. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if it's the first one or not, but I had a hole. I don't remember. I remember having it. I, you know, I, I've had four holes in one in my lifetime. One was a long time ago when I was 20 in Martinsville, Indiana, and I got stupefied on beer afterwards. But the rest of them I had more recently have all been on courses I built. I had one at uh, Crooked Stick and another one in the Dominican Republic at the Teeth of the Dog, and I had one here. Uh, the ocean course ranks as one of the country's greatest and was recently selected by Golf Digest as the toughest course in America. Now, do you take pride in those rankings? I mean, is it something you aim oh, for? Oh, no, no, no. You take pride in, 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 in the golf course rankings change and, and the people that come to play it, they, they change. Sometimes you, in one magazine you'll be way up top and the next magazine you're way down at the bottom. And, and you've been in golf. Lord, I've been in golf, playing golf probably 77 years and uh, you know uh, your impression of a golf course is how you play that day. I don't care what day anybody says. So whoever probably gave it the hardest rate, you may have had a bad day <laughs> or the wind was blowing. But no, it, this, is, is a, this is a severe golf course. And um, you think it's a course that is suitable to the best players, but also to, to well, the public? Well, uh, uh, yeah. The thing about the, the golfing world, it, it, it's, it's the golfers that play golf and love to play golf, shoot 80, 90, 100, and the ardent golfers, they, they'll, they'll stand in line to play Pine Valley. They'll, they'll go over in, in Scotland and play golf for f three weeks in the rain, and, and somebody will call that an average golfer. You'll never hear me call them average, but there are so many people in this game that love to play golf. and. Uh, and even their skills are not like Tiger Woods or a long way from it. They're to 85 or 90, but they love the game of golf. They play it all the time. And they, and they look to go to Baldur's Row. They look to go to Pebble Beach. They, and, and here, they, they, they come here. And, and, uh, and the resorts like um, the one up at uh, Whistling Straits, uh, they, they just go up there and play all the time. And uh, I tried to build a golf course for a real fine resort called Nemecolon, and, uh, and, and I modified it and, and it didn't build it strong. And it never got off the, it, it was always in between, but I've gone back and strengthened it and, uh, and made it more severe. More people are playing. Now you tell me. But uh, I tell you another thing that is a marvel, the, uh, uh, the, the stadium course I built out in California for, they call it the PGA Stadium course. And they had the, the uh, touring professionals went out there and played it. And they put up a petition never to come back. And they were upset about this golf course, too hard. In the meantime, they've been out there now 25 years, and it's the most played golf course in the desert. Pros can't play it, but those people that some people call average, you'll never hear me call them average, that shoot 90, they go out and play it. And you go back and and they go back and play it. They not only play it once, they go back. We love those people. 
And I love those people. <laughs> they are great. They're great people. Uh, you had a chance to uh, attend some of the practice rounds during the Ryder Cup. Um, would the difficulties that both teams experienced during the tournament surprise you after seeing them practice? Well, during the practice, it was it, it, the weather was uh, was in the, in the 80s, and the wind was out of the south east. And I remember Ray Floyd. Ray's always he's a good friend, but he's always telling me all the things I've done wrong. But he said, you know, this is a great course and it's fine. And the next morning, uh, I got up and, and uh, early, and and the temperature dropped to about 55, and the wind had started to come out of the northwest strong. And I noticed uh, Fred Couples and in, 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 in Raymond, I think they hit a three wood in a either a nine iron or a wedge the, to the first green. And uh, I saw, uh, I think it was uh, Ray hit a good drive off there with a, I think he's still with a three wood, and Fred Couples stand there with a three iron going into the green. It just changed so dramatically, the weather. And it stayed that way most of the week where the wind was coming from the northwest. And so where uh, uh, number nine had been uh, a difficult par four during the practice round, one of them, they talked about it a little bit, they were driving through the fairway into the bunker shore of the green. And uh, they played 10, 11, and 12 all downwind. And then all of a sudden, or they've been playing 14 and 15, 16, 17, 18 with the wind. Now they got a, a 20 knot northwester and it's coming off their left shoulder. And I never saw shots like they uh, hit on the 14th, the par three. And time they got to the 17th hole, it was just unbelievable. And uh, the day before they were hitting six or seven iron to the 17th green. And the last day, uh, Hale Irwin hit a wood to 17th green. So it didn't change all during the tournament. It came right out of the nor northwest, and so it was it was it was kind of good in a lot of ways because you always say uh, the golf professionals have a chance to play a golf course. They get to know it. Then when they play another team, it just there one or two days, they don't really get to know the golf course. Well, in in, in looking back at the whole uh, uh, event, nobody knew the golf course because none of them had ever played under the northwest wind. And uh, or conditions like they played in, during, the, during the tournament, and it came down just a half a shot was the difference. And Hale, uh, Hale Irwin winning on the last hole, or holding together on the last hole, and uh, really um, Hale hit a bad drive on the on the 18th hole, and uh, hit uh, uh, the the young lady that was the uh, was the uh, general manager of the tournament. What's her name? Kathy, uh, big, tall, nice-looking blonde girl. And uh, and she worked and put all this together and hadn't hadn't come out to see any of the tournament. She finally came out on the last hole, the last day, and Hale hit that drive and it had gone into that alligator pond if it hadn't hit her. So that's what happened. <laughs> now that was a, that was a match play event. Now the senior PJ and the PJ are stroke play events. How do you think they're going to fare? Well, they'll they'll. If one thing, the PJ does a marvelous job of setting up the golf course, and you can set the golf course for those players. They're good players, and they'll play okay. And Kerry Haig does a wonderful job for them, and uh, and they'll do it. They had the they had the World Cup here, and they had good scores set up when they had to set up for the World Cup. But I I uh, I'm I hope that they'll set it up strong enough that it'll be a real test, and I'm sure they can do that. But that'll be up to Kerry Haig. But for the PGA Championship, if, if less things don't change too much, there'll be plenty of golf course out here for that, I'm sure. But um, you know, the, these, these these fellows are good players, and the, you have to do something unusual to make it unplayable for them. You came back in '97 before the World Cup and added like five acres of turf and added a lot of collection. Yeah. Was that in response to that being a, a stroke play event? You know, no, no, not not at all. But uh, it just, uh, you know, it was, it was before we added some of the turf was just it stopped some of the erosion. That was one of the reasons for it. But another thing is, I've been watching the golf professionals play, and and they get uh, studied all the time. And and when you add runoff areas and keep it cut short, they they'll average a higher their average will be higher than if they're in the bunker. 
they can get, they can get up and down out of the bunker. If they say they're 30 feet away from the pin or 60 feet away from the pin or they're in a runoff area 30 or 60 feet away, they'll, they'll take more shots, they'll lose a half a shot off of close mowed turf than they will out of the bunker. Now if they get Jack Nicholas's way and start furring those bunkers, that'll go back. But when they're in the bunker, you know, it's not much of a shot for a good player. And I kind of hope that someday that they will go back to furring them because they can do that for the pros. And when they leave town, you can just smooth them over and let the rest of the people play. Uh, now, with the actual design of the course, uh, with the near constant but shifting winds, did that you have to take that into account in your design? Yeah, yes, he uh, definitely had the, uh, uh, the the feeling that you know that uh, that that the that the wind was going to change. I felt almost would change this golf course almost 1,300 yards from the because it usually comes either south or north. And, and, and it changes the, the effect of this golf course about 1,300 yards. So uh, what happened for the, during the, the Ryder Cup, they had the uh, stanchions set up for the, the wind out of the southeast. And then the whole w week of the tournament blew out of the northwest. I think, if, I don't think it was a mistake, but uh, I think if that happens again, they'll they'll change the stanchions because some holes are <clears throat> into the wind or just impossible to play, but then if you, there's plenty of pl uh, places to adjust it. But then on the other hand, if it's downwind, you want to go back as far as you can. <coughs> Talk about some of the uh, other changes you've made at the course in, 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 well, in 97, 2002, and 2003. Well, we, you know, the. When, uh, when we first built this golf course and, and tried to get the, the sand to keep from moving all the time, and then after the, being watching it for a number of years every summer and talking to the superintendent, we added a lot of turf in different places to stop the erosion. I think when we added it also, we, we bunkered it a little, instead of just being native and sand, we bunkered it different, like the right side of number 11, there's some bunkers you can get in on the right side of 11, even though it's turf now, that's just as difficult as it was before when it was wide open. But most of those areas we added to were for erosion pur purposes. Now you, um, you moved the 18th green over. Um, was that something that you wanted to do originally but couldn't because of the dropping of the stakes? Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, the critical line we had it right up against the critical line, and then when they came back, finally after the golf course is finished, and resurveyed it, and moved the critical line out, well then then you could change what what that did. It didn't change the hole dramatically. Uh, the green was pretty much the same. The bunkering was pretty much the same, but just shifting it, I think it was about 30 to 60 feet to the right. Then went from the landing area, you're just looking at the ocean. The ocean is really the background. You could, you could, of course, stand in the landing area. You could see the ocean where the old green was, but, but all of a sudden the green just became right in line with looking down the ocean. It's more a, a, aesthetics than anything else. Now you you've studied a lot of European courses. Is there any influence uh, from European courses in your design here? Well, yes, the, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, all, all the different Scottish and Irish golf courses are on sand. And in our country, in the United States, why most of where either on rock or clay or something like that, and you don't get the opportunity to build on sand. And even uh, like St. Andrews is a very flat course, but it's all on sand. And the contrary, and the little undulations are all there. They come on those sand golf courses. Then you go to um, Valley Bunyan or something like that. They got a great big sand dunes, but the basic concept of the fairway and the drainage and everything is because it's on sand. And I'd hate to go and have to build a golf course on clay in, in Scotland or Ireland because the great ones you hear about are all on sand. In our country, uh, the new courses that, that you read about, Brandon Dunes and all those out on the west coast are on sand. And when you, and here it's all sand, but uh, Whistling Straits was clay and you had to make it look like sand. It's a little different, but... Uh, is there any particular course that you had uh, in mind when you designed here? No, no, it's a combination of courses, but I, I, 
There was one I really liked, it was called Cruden Bay. It was a really a fun golf course to see and how the, the, the contouring of that. It was natural, of course. All those golf courses uh, the, uh, that you hear about or read about uh, in Scotland or Ireland, uh, that's the ground, that's the way it is. It's, it's all blown in there, around there. And, and then you here you're trying to take an area that was r relatively flat and make it look like a course, but this thing looks like any golf course. It's it's uh, Port Marnie in in, in right in in, uh, in Ireland. It has the same sand and in the wetlands look and the same look at the ocean. One of the uh, things that you you didn't have to incorporate cart, you know, asphalt and concrete cart paths. Did that have uh, impact in design? You know, not well, no, no, that. no, no. Uh, the, uh, the, we always have been. I always have tried to get away from uh, concrete or blacktop, and and there's a material here. It's a it's a ground shell called coquina, and and as long as you keep it worked on, it it makes a, a cart. You can get a cart on it. And the main thing is that it's part of this is just a high grade of sand, and you, it's part of the golf course, so you can play on it. So that's a big advantage to have material like that close by. Well, since this course was originally commissioned for a match play event, did uh, that have any influence on your design? For example, in '17, you made it a, a go for broke, you know, do or die type of a hole. You know, uh, all the par threes. My bride, I keep talking about my bride, been married 57 years. Alice has played golf with Ben Hogan, Byron Nelson, Sam Snead, Jack Nicholas, the whole world, Palmer, and Mickey Wright, and Babe Zaharias, and all that. And and then she's every Tuesday, she's at our club at home, she goes out and plays the golf today with three ladies that can't break 130. And, and she's always, every time I build a par three, she says it's not hard enough. And she really think, thinks that, uh, in her own mind, that you try to uh, strengthen the par threes as much as possible, because she feels she can take that tee for that lady that shoots 130 and get her someplace that she can make that lady play the golf hole. So uh, uh, when I was building 17 here, uh, and it was, I thought, a pretty good par three, she came back and said, you know, this is not near severe enough for this golf course, she, mentally. And same thing with the 17th hole at, 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 at TPC. And, and all the par threes at Harbor Town, she pushed me on all of those. And, and the par three at, uh, at Whistling Straits is pretty severe. But her thinking is that, you know, you can put that 130, that lady that loves to play golf and shoots 100 or 120 or 30, you can put her tee someplace, you know where she's coming from, and you can make, make it so she can play that hole. But you, rest of us are supposed to suffer from now on. I guess that's our way of doing it. Hey, um, your two other famous oceanfront courses, Casa de Campa and Whistling Straits. What are the design strengths and merits of the ocean course compared to those two? Well, this is all sand, and 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 the, the, the one in the Dominican Republic, Teeth and Dog, is kind of like Pebble Beach. It's on rock. It's 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 the. Uh, the, the water comes into play a lot more than here, but it's an entirely different type of golf course. Uh, they're not even uh, in the same ball game as far as construction, or it's a different look. Uh, on Pebble Beach, you stand on the 18th hole, you're looking right down at the ocean, and I have seven holes right there. It's dramatic from that point of view, but it doesn't have that sand base, and, and I shouldn't say this, but I think you really have a great course, you have to have sand. It's the way it, uh, the golf course is structured and drains and plays and the little undulations you can get from sand that you can't really manufacture from clay. Um, the ocean course measures 7937 from the middle of the back tee. It was built <laughs> over 15 years ago. Did you foresee the increase in distance? The I course? did. And I yelled about it and screamed about it and saw it coming. And still can't believe it. They keep telling me now they've got to stop, but I don't believe them today. And and, and if 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 you if I ever you know you really, I wish I could say to you that 
they, they're not going to let that ball go any farther anymore. But uh, uh, I'm afraid the aerodynamics, they, can, they figure it out. They know how to make it go farther without hitting it. Farther. But maybe now uh, they got to the point when you watch them play the Masters just this week that the, by uh, the ball is going so far they can't control it. I don't know. But it, uh, it's getting, they're getting wilder all the time. So I guarantee you, if, if like I built the university of course for Purdue, and when they had the Big Ten there just four or five years ago, none of the players could carry the bunkers. And then they had the prelude to the um, National Intercollegiate, which is gonna be next year. They had some of them in there playing, and, and 20, 22 or 23 boys could carry those bunkers. So in just four years, it, all of a sudden everybody gets stronger. That, that's not true. It was equipment. Had to been equipment. And uh, if, if, if I knew exactly that's going to stop, then you knew, would know exactly where to, to get ready for. Uh, I mean, they all say that the, it's everybody taking push-ups and doing this and making, them, making it go farther. Uh, John Daly is hitting it farther today than he did in 1991, and John Daly has not done one push-up. Since 1991, I guarantee you. And, and but but the it, they, to me, they they're going to have to put a stop to where the distance, where the when the equipment's making the ball go farther. Oh yeah, it, it, the ocean golf course. You can most every green you can roll it into the green some way or another. You can roll it onto the green, and uh, of course <clears throat> we don't have the luxury of. Uh, the fescue grasses that are firm, which makes the bump and run better, because of Bermuda grass or zoysia grass or the or the paspalum, it never runs like like the fescue. So even though you have the same contours, the same shaping, the same bump, the grasses that, that grow here don't don't readily just roll into the green. But but all the greens out here, uh, with exception of the par threes, have an opening to them to get into the. You can roll the ball into the to the green. And um, basically, you know, when you manufacture a course like here, uh, you're creating every hole because on this side, the front nine with a lot of low ground and marshes and this, so you're you're, you're creating the, the the hole. And uh, we balanced it out so when you when the, from the driving point of view, that the hole felt off the tee like he was playing main hazards on the left side and it played right to left. And then the next hole, you make it go left to right. So we were able to balance out the driving area out here, where uh, that there's about equal as many times you feel like you ought to play the ball right to left off the tee, and then left to right. And and that's that doesn't disturb the uh, the, uh, the tourists playing. They that doesn't come, but that bothers the good players to be off balance. And then especially if you can make the t hole like no, even the first hole you feel like the, it's a drive is a little bit right to left off the tee and then all of a sudden the, the approach in the green it feels just the opposite left to right and even though they're there these guys are great players but it it's that balance that you're striving for in the second hole the same way it's a big dog leg right to left off the tee and then it opens up left to right into the green and if you constantly keep doing that it uh, it it, it, it stresses the good player where when well, you and I are out there we're just trying to get home no matter where it is you know it, it's, you don't mentally it doesn't mentally work on you but it does work on the good player tell us about your relationship with, with uh, Bill Goodwin you've uh, worked with him quite a while and, and uh, he, he's kind of worked with you on, on uh, rebuilding this course yeah. well you know Mr. Goodwin I call him Mr. Goodwin my wife calls him Bill but he's, he's a great person and he loves golf. He really loves the game of golf, and uh, it, it, he's really been great for golf because when he came here to Kiowa, he took all the golf courses, the Gary Player course and Jack's course and Tom's, and they really put them all in good condition. They've just not stopped right out here at the Ocean Course and let the rest go down. But no, just the opposite. He's done a. Uh, he's really put the island in golf, and uh, I mean there's. There's four golf courses out here, a second to none, as far as I'm concerned. They're all different, which is good because the golfers, uh, they'll come out here and like to get beat up on this golf course out here, but they're like all men. You know, 
one they you don't know whether they prefer blondes or redheads or brunettes or the, the, but variety always seems to get gets everybody's attention and they and they're all all the golf courses are are different and and in fact Tom's got a fine course over there and, and Jack's got a real good one over there it's a total point is a fine really a good course and, and they fixed up Gary players course and it's a it's a it's it's a it's a good test to golf all of them and they and they and Mr. Goodwin set up a program to to uh, maintain these things to, to the element, and of course the other courses are inland and not blown away out here. It's hard to keep telling him that this course not only walks it swims, and because of the exposure it has out here. But uh, and then I built this one golf course at, at Harbor Town for Mr. Goodwin, and and now Tim Liddy and I are building and rebuilding one of the old courses at, at Harbor Town and the Sea Pines Plantation. But he, I never saw anybody just loves the game of golf like Mr. like he does. He really does, and he and he expects his staff to really perform and and gives them the way the way to perform to put their golf courses in in, in great, great condition. And you know when you build something, and a lot of times you leave and you think you've done the greatest thing in the world, but if it's not maintained and and people nowadays is in our country. Uh, they look at Augusta, and not one blade of grass is out of place, so they just drift down to your club and the, even down to the public courses. That's the image that people think of. They don't look at, they, they probably forgot about how Tiger won over last year in, in uh, England. There wasn't a green blade of grass on the whole golf course, but that's not accepted over here in our country. And, uh, and Mr. Goodwin understands that, and he tries very hard to get all these golf courses and, and as a 10, maintenance-wise. Great. Um, let's go hole by hole here, and kind of just, you know, if you were playing the course, okay. what, you know, what you're doing, if you think of any design features that are unique, that'd be great. Okay. Well, you know, you try to start out the first hole, make it a, a, a relatively short par four, and it, and, and it plays a little bit right to left off the tee, and it's open, the green opens from the left to right. and. It, and the contours on the greens are, are, we built this golf course again and knowing that they, they're going to cut the greens faster and shorter all the time, we slowed the contours down so that uh, the ball wouldn't run off and sing. But, the, but here being flat, we, we, the, um, the contours, we didn't make much of a slope from the back end to the front. It's all within the green. And uh, Tom Watson says you build these things with double brakes all the time. I don't think the, the uh, tourists realize that, but that's the way the first hole is, is very much so. And then second hole, par, par five, is very, very much a right to left shot off the tee. And, it's, and, then, and for the good player, professional player, it's the opening is left to right into the green. And um, I think that the balance there, and, and hopefully they'll play it where the, these senior players will have a, they can go out the green with a four wood or five wood on their second shot. And you don't want them to hit a seven iron, but, but it's the length is to adjust it that way. And the funny thing, the next thing is a, 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 the, uh, the third hole, where everybody talks about that knobbed up green, that was there. That was one of the few things that was just there. and. Uh, uh, I just remember flattening off the top of that, and and Keith Sparkman was here, and Jason McCoy, both of them were out there, and we just made it slope one percent from front to back, and one percent from left side to the right side, and walked off. <laughs> and everybody keeps saying how much, we, how, why did I create that green? It didn't take two hours to shape the top of that green, so we didn't do anything. But uh, man upstairs, so you can blame him for that green. It's there. And four, and it was a tough one because now we're getting out in the wetlands, and and we're trying to recycle all the water back, and and it was limited area out there, and and uh, we kept mitigating and mitigating to try to get enough area in the landing area for somebody to play. And there's a crossing there where the from the um, marshland, the, the saltwater marsh, into the interior, which was supposed to be. Salt water too, 
and and uh, those crossings always catch the, the higher handicap player, and I never could get the get those covered over. But uh, they've now let us put paspalum in there and clean them up, and and we're trying to get as much salt water to cross that fairway into the in interior land. But when you when you the, there was a limited amount of land to build that hole on number four, but it's it's. Uh, uh, they've kept the uh, the wetlands and, and everything cleaned up pretty good, so if a person can find his ball, and move on. But the fourth hole was probably about as much from a uh, from a uh, construction point of view as, as difficult to build a hole as any of them because of the of the wetlands of where they were, were located. And then we tried to recycle all the way from four all the way back into here, and bring the water all the way back because. Uh, north of the four, or the, they got special wetlands and they have fish and this and so forth. But all the water from four green comes back this way. So it doesn't go into any of those marshes out there. And same with five. But five had a little more elevation and uh, it was much easier to build. The par three, and of course, par threes are always easier to build because of um, it's just half a hole and, and, and the elevation was all there. And then five was really a good chance. See, the, the land ran mostly north-south, but then it was a chance to go east-west, go really east with a shot. And, and uh, that was helpful to kind of break that continuous one line of uh, the wind changing on you. But five, I, 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 it had the, as good a view of the ocean from the, uh, that end of, the, of any hole. It worked out fine. And then really, the, uh, you got to coming back on the par on the next uh, par four, uh, six hole, and you're starting to get back where they had some of the live oaks. And uh, after Hugo, the live oaks really took a beating, and I thought we'd lost all of them. And uh, we brought people down here and and worked on them, worked on them, and they really I looked at them today, and they, many of them are really. Finally, it's taken all this time to get back from Hugo to get back into pretty good shape. And, and so we were, they were such an unusual to have them out here on the point. And so we really tried to work, try to save as many as we could. And uh, six and seven had that different feeling of, 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 from the uh, live oak trees, big time, I think. And then they, the, uh, to the left of those holes, uh, there was there was quite an area to get to the ocean, but it was all saltwater wet, wetlands, and you could always see the uh, um, the ocean from those holes, and it, and it, that changes quite a bit because between there and the ocean, one year you'll get a lot of myrtles will grow up, the next year they'll disappear. That changes the the, the whole island at the, at that point. The sand is blowing in. And, into the wetlands and that changes the, the wetlands itself. They, they, they're accreting, what they call it, they're growing up or down, or, but they're changing. They, you, one year you think they're getting drier, the next year you think they're getting wetter. It's, it changes all the time. But the, uh, I think what happened, uh, is, is the sixth hole played right to left off the tee and then the seventh hole just, just reverse. But you could run the ball in the six and seven green pretty easily. And then when you get to eight, the par three there, you got my my bride talking to me and you block off the front of the green because she moves the ladies tee up to a position where they can play golf. And then the nine, I thought nine was so long uh, and from the back tee even then I think it was 480 or 90 yards and that was long in 91. Maybe it's not long today but it was into the uh, southeast wind during the practice of the Ryder Cup. And the day that the Ryder Cup started, it was big time downwind. And here, they, the heck, they drove almost through the fairway. But there's a big opening on nine. Uh, T plays off right to left, and the green plays right to left in it. But you can bounce it into that green. Bunkers are all on the left-hand side and the bailout. And the bailout on the right side is cut short, and you can find your ball and hit it, but it's a much more difficult shot than the, than the sand bunkers. 
and and that's pretty well proven by I get the shot link back from the tour all the time and they give you the statistics of how many times they get up out of the bunker and how many times the good pro, those pros get up from these chipping areas and they lose about a half a shot it's unbelievable so that then you have to get your trolley and ride from nine green to to uh, 10 T and that's when um, Alice got into the act and said 10 11 and 12 you got to build them up so that uh, uh, you can see the ocean and that's what she started all that and and those are all really manufactured holes all the dunes on 10 11 and 12 was saying that we piled in there to raise them up to see over the the, in, the, the incoming holes to see the ocean and then therefore we could change the the, the shot like off a of 10 it's you feel like it's a little bit left to right off the tee and then right to left into the green and and then you play uh, 11 and it's left to right off the tee and it's the right to left shot coming back in there so you bounce out and then you go to 12 it's just the opposite 13 is all left to right but you can vary it all all the way around so that the good player you, you know, if you take these fellows and they're they're really great players, and you get them hitting every shot, a little left to right. By the time they get around to 18, they got it honed in pretty good. But if you vary it and change it as often as you can, they're all of a sudden they're just they're they're not keeps them off balance. The rest of this world, we don't know what's going on, but it does the good player. And and I think that what happened on. Um, uh, on the back side and coming back in then we could go the critical line we move right up against on a 14 and and then you know there, there's no such thing as uh, rebuilding the exact redan hole as like at North Berwick but similar idea so 14 is a similar as a retain a redan type hole and it plays a lot uh, better uh, down it's big enough green that they can play it downwind and hit a seven or eight iron to the green from back there. But during the Ryder Cup, they were standing back with three irons and the wind was coming off their left shoulder. And I didn't see anybody hit the green. It was amazing. It was a disaster on, 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 uh, on 14. And then when you played 15, I tried to make it where 14, the green was up. And you stand on 14, the next thing you look at is Portugal. And you can see, you know, everything. And then I try to move 15 uh, down a little bit to get a change of pace on that hole. And I always thought 15 uh, is one of the better holes out here. It doesn't get talked about, but personally, I always liked it. And then 16, uh, we went right back the other, other way around and, and built up the tees and built in, in the fairway and the valleys between the, the tees and the fairway and then built the green back up like we have on 14. So you get a different feel of the uh, of the uh, 15th green and so you go 14's up, 15's down and 16's uh, up. And you stand up there and you're looking everywhere on 16. And the, and the bunker on the right left hand side is deep. But uh, that when you get a bunker that deep, I'm sure that that average wouldn't be the same as what I just said about bunkers before. But but uh, that's the most severe bunker I think we have on the whole golf course as far as, and coming into 16. Then 17, I didn't have, I never was, was not gonna build a pond on the right side of 17. And Alice came in and kept telling you, you gotta do this, you gotta put something there more severe than what I had. And I was really hesitant to build a, a pond on the right side of 17 green because here's the Atlantic Ocean, you're building a pond, you're crazy. But where, of course, like the Dominican Republic, where the ocean cuts in and out, you know, it's, you can't make it come into play. So you really don't have the water in play out here like, like you, even though there's water every place, it doesn't come into play. So, and then we, I found out when I dug 16 for to get the fairways up, that we were creating a, a body of fresh water. So then I was, after she, talked to me I went ahead and built that pond on 17 and I guarantee you that during the practice rounds there wasn't anybody complaining about the 17th hole not that for those good players they were there just 
it was just a golf hole. But when it came to the time of the Ryder Cup, that wind came off their left shoulder. It was a disaster. I couldn't believe it. Either the pressure and the wind and the temperature, it would just change. And just last week at Augusta, they talked about how difficult it was. And I wonder how they would have played if it had been 75 degrees temperature every day. People don't function, the pros don't function at 50 like they do at 75 degrees, even those young fellows. But um, then at 18, we, as you can tell on the 18th fairway, we piled that thing up high enough to get this up and down view of the ocean. And that's why we did all of the, raise those fairways. But they're all manufactured, every one of them. 